we've seen that in other types of people who experience trauma or traumatic events, uh, and the most common, uh, frequent one is veterans where they have a, a numbing of the feelings that they have uh, re relating to the experiences that were too difficult for them to bear uh, at the time. Um, even 20 years later, uh, they still have some numbing. Uh, and so this process of accommodation really is this experience of trying to maybe uh, compartmentalize a lot of the feelings that they have about the victimization experiences. You talked a little bit about the concept of entrapment. Is it a myth that a child who's being sexually abused would not want to go back and see the person who's abusing them? I think it's something that is not easily understood by people. If you're being sexually abused, why would you go back over, over their house? Um, why would you want to spend time? Uh, why would you appear to enjoy time with that person? Uh, it's common for kids to have a relationship outside of victimization with the perpetrator. And as a result, it's common for kids to like that person who's abusing them, especially if that person is somebody who they, they care about, spend time with, do fun things with. Um, sometimes if you're being sexually abused by mother, father, or big brother, um, it's common for kids to love that person because they need to love caregivers. Uh, that's, what we, that's, that's what we do in families. And is there a fourth theory from which Dr. Summit called delayed unconvincing disclosure? Uh, there is. Would you describe what Dr. Summit meant by that concept? Uh, sure. Delayed disclosure is quite simple. That if the misperception is that if, if you are sexually abused, you'll tell somebody right away. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes kids are approached, they're sexually abused, and immediately go and tell somebody. That actually happens uh, just a, a minority of times. Uh, the research shows that it's quite common for kids to have a delay in time from when they are first sexually abused to when they disclose that, that they have been sexually abused. Uh, what that means is a couple of things. The strategy that was imposed upon them to keep it a secret must be pretty effective if they can keep kids quiet about their sexual abuse for a significant period of time. So the idea that kids will tell right away is really not a common thing. Uh, it's really uncommon that kids tell right away. Um, the third part of the accommodation syndrome is delayed and unconvincing disclosure. Um, the best way to describe this is to think of sexual abuse as a process that is really hard to, to talk about. Victimization is difficult, and if you are a child who perhaps was threatened or perhaps felt embarrassed or humiliated uh, about the experiences you participated in, it's really hard to put yourself in a position to tell somebody about that. And so what we found is that kids who go through this process of disclosure are often somewhat vague in providing some information. Um, if they responded to positively or uh, supportively, uh, they, they may say more and, and at times go on. Uh, they may tell more about their victimization experience uh, over different uh, uh, iterations. Um, they also may make some minor mistakes about disclosure. Uh, if you have somebody that says five or four different times, uh, they're not exactly alike every single time. Uh, then they may, they may look un unconvincing. Uh, that is, uh, Dr. Summit was talking about the fact that th this process, which we n now have research to support, this process of disclosure may ultimately look like the child was not telling the truth or was unconvincing in their dis description of what happened to them because their disclosures are not identical every single time. Is the concept of consistency taken into consideration in that disclosure process by Dr. Summit? I think that's part of the process. Um, the child may not be completely consistent, may not be able to articulate clearly the first time what happened. It may take a couple of times before a child is able to provide some kind of description about what happened to them in their victimization. 
What studies, if any, were relied upon with regard to the proposition that a child might not disclose immediately about sexual abuse? Well, there are actually about four or five studies. The one that I usually use is by Elliot Breyer, or Breyer Elliot. Um, they found basically about three quarters of kids failed to disclose the first 12 months from when they were abused. We shouldn't expect that kids will disclose right away, although some kids do. Uh, some kids have some significant delay by the time they're able to disclose. And is it also fair to say some kids never disclose? That's sort of a reasonable assumption to make. In research that I've done with adults, there were a fair number of adults who never disclosed in their childhood. So if you were to say there are children who never disclose, understanding who never disclose, understanding that when, when they hit 18, uh, they're no longer children. Um, I would agree with that. There may well be and probably are people who never disclose throughout their entire lifetime. In the last theory that Dr. Summit talks about, something called retraction? Yes. Would you briefly talk a little bit about that? Sure. Again, we're talking about children who have been sexually abused and who, uh, and what we found was that there are a small percentage of children who have been sexually abused who made a disclosure, who then took back the allegation of, of abuse. Um, Summit goes on to talk about some of the reasons why a child who was abused would take back the allegation. He essentially points to the child having access to the perpetrator. Presumably, the perpetrator reinforces the threats or coercion, so the child keeps quiet. Sometimes other things like pressures put on by the family about the abuse uh, for a variety of reasons uh, results in the child retracting allegations of abuse. Okay, did Dr. Summit write a second article about nine, ten years later called Abuse of the Child Sexual Abuse Accommodation? Yes, it was either 1990 or 92, somewhere around there. And what was the premise of the second article? He felt that at that time that there was some misuse of the uh, child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome. He felt people were using the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome as a way to, to, to diagnose child abuse. Um, if you have these five things, then you're sexually abused. And, and he was arguing that that would be an improper use of the child uh, abuse accommodation syndrome because it, it, it's not the place of uh, mental health professionals to say whether a particular person is a perpetrator or not, or a particular child has been sexually abused. Uh, that's a, a criminal issue and a jury issue. So he, he was arguing if anybody is using it that for that purpose, it, it's inappropriate. Uh, this is not a diagnosis. It's, it's really an educational tool to explain what happens with sexual abuse. The other thing that he was trying to explain is that there's a lot of discussion about what the definition of a syndrome is. Um, because it is called child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome, people often equate syndrome with uh, diagnosis or medical condition, and there's been a lot of arguments or discussion about whether child abuse accommodation syndrome is really a syndrome or not. Um, I, I actually think it is, uh, in my opinion, but his position is that he wishes we would not use the term syndrome because it detracts from the overall idea, which is just to explain what happens with kids who have been sexually abused.